University of Pennsylvania and as a system professor, then now he's a um, um, uh, full professor in the material science department. He has won uh, many awards, including um, a Nas National Science Foundation Career Award in 2007, uh, National Institute of Health uh, Pioneer, um, I mean Innovator Award in 2010, and then recent, more recently SPIE Nano Engineering uh, Leadership Award. Um, most recently, since 2017, he has been a director of a, a MURI um, project on a phase changing material for photonics, uh, which I'm uh, proudly being a team member. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, uh, uh, let, uh, let us uh, welcome uh, Professor Agawa. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mo. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me and uh, giving, uh, giving uh, us the opportunity to present some of the work that my uh, group has been doing. Uh, so uh, my group basically, you know, we have a variety of interests uh, and uh, a significant portion of what we do can be classified as uh, broadly as our efforts towards understanding how light interacts with small scale or low dimensional materials. And uh, in the talk, I'll basically you know, give, you know, I'll go uh, take you through the journey that we have uh, undertaken in the last you know, seven or eight years uh, towards our efforts in understanding how light, how we can understand how light interacts with uh, low dimensional systems, you know, the techniques that we've, uh, you, know, you know, we continuously develop new techniques to, uh, you know, to extract useful information uh, about how light interacts with small scale structures. Uh, and then uh, I'll finish with uh, some of the very recent work, and that is, you know, where, where the band, electronic band structures start to become more complex. For example, you know, they become topologically uh, non-trivial, uh, and, and then our efforts towards understanding how those you know, interactions shed new insights about what is happening. Okay, so um, broadly speaking, uh, you know, light matter interaction can be classified, uh, you know, again, very broadly speaking, in two re uh, into two regimes. One is what is called the weak coupling regime. Uh, so this is basically the interaction of uh, your you know, electronic material with its surrounding. So if the interaction is uh, in the weak coupling regime, then the coupling of this uh, electronic system or, or, the, or these excitations that happen in the system, uh, the coupling constant or the, co or the energy of this coupling is actually much smaller than uh, uh, any of the decay line widths. So basically what happens is uh, the system basically, uh, is, you know, uh, because the weak, uh, coupling is weak, it basically uh, dissipates uh, to the environment. Uh, and, and this is the weak coupling regime. In this regime, what happens is, uh, uh, since this coupling is much smaller than any of the decay line widths, uh, then this can be treated in a perturbation, uh, in the perturbation limit, which basically means you use time-dependent perturbation theory uh, using uh, the Fermi's golden rule can extract very important parameters. For example, one of the very classic well-known effect is what is called the Purcell effect. Uh, and regular photonic lasing also is in, in this weak coupling regime. The other regime is what is called the strong coupling regime, and here, exactly the opposite of what happens here. The coupling strength between you know, the, the system or the material with the surrounding is much, much more than any of the decay line widths. Because the coupling is very strong uh, compared to the decay line widths, the system can actually undergo multiple oscillations before it decays to the, you know, or dissipates to the environment. Uh, so what happens in this regime is because the coupling is very strong compared to the you know, initial eigenstates that make up the system, then uh, perturbation theory is not, you know, is not the best way. Uh, and then you have to re-diagonalize the Hamiltonian, something that I'll talk about, and then create new mixed eigenstates of the system. So let's say you start with your electronic excitations in a system, for example, and your uh, optical cavity, uh, and then you hybridize the system. And again, because you're hybridizing the system, the new states that you create are actually uh, admixtures, or coherent mixtures of both light and matter. And these states are called polaritons. I'm, and I'm going to talk about uh, all these things in more detail. So uh, just a few examples of the weak coupling regime, uh, which, is, you know, which can be described by the Fermi Golden Rule. So in 1946, uh, Purcell wrote a half a page paper in Physical Review, where he derived this uh, very, very you know, seemingly simple but very important formula called, the, uh, uh, you know, which basically deals with the rate of emission, a spontaneous emission enhancement because of the presence of a cavity. Again, you know, this is a perturbative limit, so for, all he used was Fermi's, Fermi's golden rule. So he found was the rate can be mod, uh, modulated, uh, enhanced, or de-enhanced, uh, de and that is proportional to a very important metric, Q by V, where Q is what is called the quality factor, which is a measure of how efficient 
your cavity is in storing uh, optical energy. So just like a capacitor stores charge, optical cavity stores optical energy. So the efficiency of that uh, storage is, uh, is given by this quality factor divided by what is uh, this V, which is the mode volume, and that is a measure of how confined the optical mode is in the cavity. So important thing to note here is it's not proportional to Q or V, or, in, or one by V, but it's Q by V. And like many things, Q and V actually work against each other. For example, if you make very large cavities where the personal factor can be, where Q can be, or the quality factor can be of the order of millions, uh, the mode volume also increases, and Q by V basically becomes at most a factor of 10 or 20. So you can get 10 or 20 times enhancement. But on the other hand, in plasmonic systems where you have like a single you know, metal nanoparticle which can confine light very locally, uh, the mode volume can become 1,000 or 10,000 times smaller than the free space uh, lambda cube, but the quality factor also drops. So again, Q by V uh, comes back to a factor of 10 or 20 or 30. So, uh, so what we did was, uh, you know, many years back, and I won't, you know, I won't talk about this in too much detail, what we found was by, by combining some attributes of surface plasmons, but not localized surface plasmons, so basically we took a nanowire made out of semiconductor, and then we conformally wrapped a plasmonic metal so at the interface of a semiconductor and a metal, one can launch uh, surface plasmon modes. And at certain sizes, because this is a cylindrical structure, so at certain sizes, one can have constructive interference of the mode, and you can create these highly intense whispering gallery modes at the interface you know, uh, of a metal, uh, metal and a semiconductor, and because of which we could get Purcell factors uh, of the order of 1,000. So this was one of the first demonstrations of, you know, of obtaining Purcell factors order of magnitude more than people could get before. And this is because we, we, we combined the unique attributes of a propagating plasmon or a surface plasmon polariton uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with this uh, closed cavity structure. So then what we did was because uh, you know, the, the Purcell factor is of the order of uh, the Purcell factor that we can get of, of the order of 1,000, it completely changes the kinetics or the dynamics of the cavity in the sense that most of the emission when the Purcell factor is 1,000, which basically means if the lifetime of, of a semiconductor is nanoseconds, with this cavity, the lifetime becomes picoseconds. And in picosecond time scale, the, the, the carriers that you excite or the excitons that you create don't have time to thermalize. So most of the emission comes from unthermalized carriers. So by utilizing this, we started to think, can we, can we do something more interesting? And that interesting thing was, <coughs> Now, the question we asked was, can we make materials which don't emit light? And that material, for example, is silicon. Silicon, as we all know, is, a, is, is an indirect band gap semiconductor. And the reason why it does not emit light is because upon optical excitation or electrical excitation of the carriers, the carriers basically move away from the gamma point. Uh, and, that, and, though, and that process happens by very fast vibrational relax or phonon relaxation uh, pathways. So, but just like here, if, if we can, make the carriers recombine, if you can make the cavity lifetime comparable to the, uh, to the phonon relaxation time scale, then there's a, po then there's a possibility of you know, extracting those carriers, forcing them to recombine before they move too far away from the gamma point. So we utilized this idea and we were able to make silicon emit light with an internal quantum efficiency of 1%. That was, you know, that, that's pretty large given the fact that silicon's quantum efficiency is one in 100 or one, or one in 1,000 at least. So this is very, very small. So, so this is basically, these are examples of the weak coupling limit of the regime and some, you know, some uh, unique applications of that. So coming to the strong coupling regime, so uh, as I said, uh, in the strong coupling regime, the coupling of, you know, of, let's say the exciton, let's just focus on excitons, with, its, uh, with, its, with the cavity or its surrounding. Uh, now these values of G, or the coupling constant, become comparable, you know, of, of an appreciable fraction of the eigen original eigenstates, so you know, it could be 10% of the exciton energy. You know, that's, that's a coupling strength. Because of which, you have to re-diagonalize the Hamiltonian. You cannot use perturbative theories. So you re and you basically start getting these uh, uh, you know, new modes, which are called the polaritonic modes, uh, which basically, as you can imagine, it's a hybrid mode. So it's a mixture of exciton and, and a photon together. Uh, you know, so, you know, and depending on where you are, so this is energy and this is the wave vector, which is a you know, measure of momentum. Uh, if, uh, and if this is your exciton energy, then if you're far away from the exciton energy, then the same uh, polariton mode at, at these values of, uh, when you're far away from these uh, exciton energies, has more photon-like character, more light-like character. And, and uh, as you start approaching the exciton uh, energies, 
then you start having more exciton component in your polariton. So, you know, so just, by, you know, just by measuring or obtaining light as a function of k, uh, as an angle, for example, uh, one can basically tune the fraction or adjust the fraction of the exciton and the photon in, in, the, in the hybrid. And the important thing here is because now these hybrids have both uh, unique attributes of light and matter, so the unique attributes of, uh, of light is uh, it, it has small effective mass, it can propagate longer distances. Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, but photons, if you want to make any nonlinear device, a switch, for example, uh, or then uh, uh, photons, you know, the photon photon interaction uh, 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 is almost, uh, you know, almost uh, negligible. This is where the excitons become important. So excitons have uh, strong nonlinearities. You know, it's a material excitation, uh, uh, and they have longer lifetime. So by combining these two, you know, exciton and photons, one can get you know, unique attributes of both, and this is the reason why people were able to get what are called uh, Bose-Einstein condensation of these polaritons much more easily than just getting the uh, condensation for, for the excitons, uh, because you, know, you can get uh, unique attributes of both. Uh, so we basically showed, you know, now it's been almost seven or eight years, uh, that if you take a nanowire, uh, you know, uh, and, and then we, we measure the light matter coupling strength, so we had to develop new, uh, new techniques. So what we found was if we take a material like cadmium sulfide, then the light matter coupling strength in, in, in this uh, material does not change you know, pretty much if, if, if the size of the material is the size of this room or down to four or 500 nanometer length scale. So this, you know, the system basically behaves like a three-dimensional polariton. You know, that's the natural excitation of a, of a cadmium sulfide semiconductor. But below a certain size, which was around 200 nanometers or so, the system basically suddenly transitions in from a three-dimensional polariton to a one-dimensional you know, confined polariton and where the light matter coupling strength becomes a strong function of the size. So because now we have this very strong light matter coupling strength, you know, the material, uh, the, the exciton component is very strong, so nonlinearities are very strong, and by utilizing this, we were able to make an all optical switch. Because photons don't scatter off each other, but if we have polaritons with very large exciton component, for example, you know, excitons are material excitations, they can, they can basically scatter off. But if you scatter off two excitons, then you have to bring those excitons really close to each other, like few nanometer length scale. But because the length scale of a polariton is few hundred, nanome 100 nanometers or so uh, in, this, uh, in this regime, uh, they can interact over longer distances and, uh, and, and scatter off you know, very strongly. So we basically made all optical switches and also did some very base, you know, basic demonstrations of, you know, uh, uh, some, you know of, of uh, logical gates, for example, uh, using this uh, architecture. Okay. So this basically, you know, uh, and this is now you know, what, what I'm going to focus on for the next 15 or 20 minutes. And that is, you know, the structures that we, you know, that we were uh, initially dealing with were uh, conventional semiconductors, but the geometry was in the nanowire form, where the, cross, uh, where the diameter of these wires were you know, typically 100 or 200 nanometers, and the lengths were many microns. So uh, these materials had a natural cavity, you know, as, as you saw. We can deposit metal on all sides. So we have, you know, because of the geometry, we have natural, uh, uh, natural optical cavities or plasmonic cavities. So uh, in the last six, seven years, what has happened, is, is, as many of you know, there's a lot of interest this university is a pioneering, you know, has done pioneering work, you know, especially from Shaodong Shu's lab. Uh, so these are, so there are these new class of, uh, so-called new class of materials called transition metal dichalcogenides. So these are layered materials, and you can exfoliate them like graphene. And what happens is when you get down to a monolayer, you know, just MOS2 a monolayer, of, you know, so it's, it's actually three layers, one sulfur, one MO, and then another sulfur layer. So what happens in these type of uh, two-dimensional semiconductors is, uh, when you go from few layers to one layer, there's a transition, uh, the material basically undergoes a transition from being an indirect semi uh, band gap semiconductor to a direct band gap semiconductor. So the moment you go to a monolayer uh, limit, it basically starts to emit light, okay? The quantum efficiency of this light is very weak because of many factors, including many decay channels and non-radiative pathways. But nevertheless, compared to a bilayer, you can see, you know, this is a bilayer emission and this is a monolayer emission. It's much strong. So it's, there's a lot of interest in these materials, but, you know, and, and the reason why there's a lot of interest, and again, a lot of good work has come out from you know, this university, so when you go down, when you go to a monolayer level, you break the inversion symmetry, and the time reversal symmetry is maintained, uh, as long as you don't apply magnetic field. And because of which, uh, there's this very interesting splitting in the two, uh, two valleys, K and K prime. 
And uh, what happens here is, uh, because of this uh, different spin splitting, if you shine right circularly polarized light, then you can excite only one valley, although these are, uh, energy-wise, they are degenerate valleys, so you only excite one. And with left circularly polarized light, because of the you know, conservation of angular momentum, you excite only the other val uh, only one, one of the two valleys. So by doing this, uh, you know, uh, uh, spin selective optical excitation, you can address one valley or the other. You know, and this has basically led to this all, all excitement of what is called valleytronics. From the perspective of this talk, so we are utilizing this into our architectures. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if I don't think I'll get time to talk about this. But another very important attribute, which is important for this talk, is uh, once once you go down to mono layer or few layer uh, few layers of this material, uh, unlike you know thicker semiconductors. Uh, uh, there is no bulk, uh, there is very little bulk polarization in these materials. So the carriers are not adequately screened. So the screening is very small. Because the screening is uh, very weak in these materials, because you know, uh, you know, electric line, field lines can escape the material and then re-enter, because of that, what happens here is the electron-electron interaction length scale or exciton interact, uh, exciton exciton or exciton electron interaction length scale. So any excitations that you create in the system the length scale of those interactions becomes much longer range than conventional semiconductors because there is no, there's very little screening. So there's, uh, there's this beautiful work that came out many years back, uh, I, think, I think this is from Lou, uh, uh, Tony Heinz's group, where they showed that you know, if you take this material, then you get mostly emission from this free exciton, and as you start injecting electrons in the system uh, via applying some gate voltage, then you can tune the emission spectrum where the emission from the exciton decreases and the emission from what is called the trion that's basically an exciton and an extra carrier, you know, a, a hybrid of an exciton and an extra carrier uh, starts to uh, dominate. So trions typically have very, they do exist in other materials, but because of the screening, large screening, uh, the binding energy is extremely weak. But here, because the screening is very weak, the trions can basically show up even at room temperature. So, so this is, you know, so these are some very unique, interesting aspects, and I'm going to talk about this, you know, how we can utilize them to make interesting devices. Uh, so this will be the focus of my talk. So, okay, so the, uh, as I had said, you know, our initial work was on nanowires which, are, which form a natural cavity because you know, of this curved geometry, but now you have a flat two-dimensional semiconductor. So how do we make, if you want to make plasmonic cavities, how do we make plasmonic cavities out of these, uh, out of these flat two-dimensional systems? We can't sandwich them between two layers of metal because you know, we have to get light in and we have to get light out. You know, so you can't do that. If we, part if, if we basically make single particle cavities, you know, where, where we basically, let's say, you know, just put one metal nanoparticle, which can confine uh, plasmons, then as I said, the quality factor is very weak. So, you know, so how do we basically make a cavity which is geometrically compatible to these uh, flat systems, and yet we can basically also utilize the surface plasmon properties? So after many iterations, we basically realized that if we can make a crystal of plasmon, so we basically pattern these metal nanoparticles, so we create a, you know, so and at each part, at each site, you have these surface plasmons, and then, uh, and, and, then at, uh, you know, and then they can basically start to oscillate together, or they can start showing these collective modes, and form basically a collective you know, mode. So because of which, uh, the idea was, we can utilize the local, very strong local confinement at each particle, combined with this, you know, this collective, what is called lattice mode, uh, you know, hopefully get much better properties uh, than, than compared to a single particle, okay? And this is basically, this, this is uh, a take of an experiment which was done more than 100 years back, you know, uh, you know given by Wood, so it's called uh, Wood Rally's uh, anomaly. So what they did was they basically created a, a, a diffraction grating or grating from metals, and so it's very similar to a dielectric grating that we all use in our, spe in our spectroscopy. The only difference is this is, you know, this is a metal, so the polarizability, because metals are free electrons, so they have very large polarizability. Because the polarizability in metals is very large, the diffraction mode tends to be much stronger than a dielectric grating. So it's, it's, physics is the same, except that the diffraction is much, much stronger. So the idea is basically borrowed from you know, this idea, which is more than 100 years old, that if you have a lattice of plasmons, because the, you know, at certain angles, we can get an in-plane diffraction mode. So what this does is, I have to skip one slide. So if we have a single particle, single metal nanoparticle, the resonances are very broad because, you know, although it's very highly confined, the resonance is very highly confined, excitation is very highly confined, but the resonances are very broad. You know, 
But if we engineer, so in this broad emission, if we engineer a diffraction mode somewhere, somewhere in this regime, then basically this splits into two very sharp modes. And you can see the quality factor has improved. So by doing this, you know, uh, what we did, uh, our first experiment was taking these two-dimensional material, MOS2, and then we patterned a lattice of these uh, uh, plasmonic bow ties. So bow ties, basically, you have a very strong mode in between the two triangles, which are very uh, closely spaced apart. And, and then you have a crystal of these plasmons. By creating this structure, we basically showed around 100 times enhancement, so personal factor of the order of 100, which is very significant for this type of system. So as I said, the quantum yield of this material is less than 1%, it's like 0.01% or 0.05%. So we, had, we showed 100 times enhancement in the emission and also Raman spectrum, uh, Raman, uh, Raman enhancement, uh, by engineering these cavities, so we can, you know, we can get personal fac uh, very large personal factors. And, uh, and, then, you know, uh, and then we can basically, uh, you know, by, uh, just by changing the geometrical par parameters, that is, that is the size of these triangles, the spacing between these triangles, we can basically get resonances at different uh, spectral locations, and we can tune the optical emission spectrum of, 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 you know, of these uh, devices. But uh, something, you know, as we, so, you know, we started to improve our, our, our materials, our, our, our fabrication, and then something very interesting started to show up. So what we found was, uh, and let me just explain. So this black curve, this, this is basically reflectance spectroscopy of, uh, of, of just a bare MOS2, so no, no metal, no plasmonic particle. So you see very sharp excitonic lines corresponding to what are called A and B excitons. And then when we basically tune the plasmonic lattice, so the blue curve is basically just the reflectance spectrum of a plasmonic lattice. And when this plasmonic lattice mode starts to come close to this, let's say, A exciton, the hybrid system basically shows this very interesting anisotropic uh, you know, scattering of basically you know, uh, this, uh, this asymmetric line shape, which is what is called a Fano, a Fano line shape. Okay? So clearly, you know, this is not in the weak coupling regime, because in the weak coupling regime, we don't change the eigenstates of the system. But now we are changing the line shape of the hybrid system. So this is not real strong coupling, which I'll talk about. But this is basically telling me that now we, have, we are moving the system away from the weak coupling towards the stronger coupling. But this is not strong coupling, uh, strictly defined. So what happens in a Fano line shape, and this, you know, you know, when I was a student at University of Chicago, I actually met Hugo Fano a few times. You know. He used to come to chemistry department seminars. And he didn't, used to, he didn't want to talk about this, you know, what the world knows him mostly for, but you know, he didn't care too much, because this was his PhD work with uh, Enrico Fermi. So, you know, but anyway, so, so what happens in a final line shape is you have a two-level state which couples to a broad continuum. So here the two-level state is the exciton system, and the broad continuum is this uh, broad plasmonic uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, excitations, or, the, or these you know, continuous spectrum from the plasmons. So if you have relatively strong coupling between the exciton and the plasmon, so then what can happen is there are two ways, let's say, there are many ways to describe it. So what happens in a Fano system is you have two pathways, two quantum pathways, and then they interfere, which basically means the initial state and the final state have to be the same. So one pathway is the direct excitation of the exciton, and the other is excitation of the plasmons, and via dipole-dipole coupling, you excite the uh, you know, exciton. So you have you know, two pathways, and when they interfere, they produce this you know, asymmetric line shape. So, you know, so this, this got me excited, not because we saw Fano line shape, not only because of that, but mostly because this was now telling me very clearly that if we optimize, if we do something interesting, and, you know, and we think about this more, then in principle we can take the system to strong coupling, which basically means we can create polaritons between the excitons in the system and, and, the, and, and the plasmons. And you know, so we improved the, you know, so then we moved from the uh, bow ties to these, uh, you know, Disc, disc type cavities because fabrication wise is easier. The inhomogeneous line width is smaller. Anyway, so after many iterations, we did, you know, uh, you know, we basically showed that we can get strong exciton plasmon coupling uh, in, in these systems. So as you can see, these, uh, these dark lines that you see basically means the anti crossing behavior between the exciton and the, and the plasmon. So if the coupling is weak, the, you know, the dispersion of the exciton and the plasmon basically crosses each other. But if, they, if, if it is strong, then it basically shows this uh, anti-crossing behavior, which I'll basically, you, know, you can now, you know, we can now see it clearly. You know. So this was basically the original exciton line, and now you can see in the hybrid system, you create this anti-crossing behavior, and you can get this uh, surface plasmons, uh, sorry, uh, uh, polaritons. And interesting thing is, by changing the geometry of the system, you know, the size of the particle or the spacing between the particles, we can tune the exciton plasmon coupling strength. You know, 
quite significantly. So it's a tunable system uh, that we can create. Yeah. So you know, this is basically what is happening. So you have the exciton. We have the exciton, which is you know, a flat, and dispersion-wise, it's flat. You have the uh, surface plasmon, which is flat. Then they, they can hybridize and create these new states, but still flat. This is the diffraction mode that we have, which is the propagating plasmon. And now you couple all these things, and we can get these, you know, these anti-crossing type behavior. This is exactly what we see in experiments. And but from the fitting, we can extract all these coupling strengths. You know. Okay, and we can also, interesting thing is, uh, again, this is a consequence of weak screening in these materials, that the exciton binding energy is of the order of a uh, you know, few hundred MeV. So it can survive, you know, it, at room temperature also, you can have very strongly bound excitons, and because of which you can get this uh, polariton behavior uh, with, with plasmons, even at room temperature. So that, that was you know, very, you know, very exciting. Okay, so then we basically, uh, you know, uh, what we did was, uh, you know, we had to, you know, we start, because as you can see, the system is very complex. We have excitons, we have plasmons, localized plasmons, we have propagating plasmons via this diffraction mode. All these, you know, these are, and then they're, they're coupling together. They have different line shapes. Excitons have a different line shape than plasmons than the diffraction mode. So what we realized was, we really had, we needed a better model to, you know, to extract and to fit what is going on and hence extract more uh, relevant parameters. So we came up with this equation of motion approach which basically takes into account all the resonances, the line shapes. So we just, the only input is the coupling strength. So we solve this and, by, and after solving this, we basically fit to all the spectra that we get across all the angles. And then, you know, and so, so as, you can do, as you can see, we can do a very good job uh, by using this, uh, you know, this model. And from there, we can extract the line shapes of the coupled system. And interesting thing here is, by, by, coming, by, bring, by solving this model, we can basically solve this for the Fano line shape, which is the intermediate coupling regime, and the strong coupling regime, which is the polaritonic regime. So you know, this, this basically shows that you know, we've got things pretty much under co good control. Okay. All right, so the, recently we've moved to WS2 because the, ex uh, because the oscillator strength of the exciton is stronger in WS2, and we can get very nice, you know, similar, you know, uh, similar behavior, but much nicer. Uh, so you know, in the next part of my talk, we're going to talk about WS2. So spectroscopy-wise, it is a very similar system to MOS2, except the, you know, it shows stronger resonances. Okay. All right, so now, uh, again, coming back to the motivation part that I had, and that is you know, these materials, as I said, these two-dimensional systems have very weak or inadequate screening. So can we utilize this to make something very you know, more useful and interesting? So what happens here is, uh, if we take a two-dimensional system and we basically create this cavity by, you know, by creating this plasmonic lattice, then the system, depending on the lattice parameters, or geometrical parameters of the lattice, the system is either in the weak coupling or the strong coupling, but that's fixed. You can't change it, right, because it's very hard to change. So can we do something to take the system in a controllable manner, in a dynamic manner, from the strong coupling to the weak coupling and back? Okay. So, you know, I, I'll explain this in more detail, but so in order to do so, what we did was we took this entire cavity that we, uh, that we can fabricate and integrated this with the field effect transistor. You know, so basically, you know, we have the source drain and gate electrodes, and this basically the idea is to, you know, to be able to inject or remove carriers from the system. And when we do this, something very interesting happens. So, so this is basically without applying any, electric, any gate electric field, so this is you know, the pristine sample, it's already slightly doped, but not heavily doped. So there we see basically strong coupling with the free exciton. You can see this anti-crossing line. So this is strong coupling with the free exciton. And then as we start to apply gate bias, which basically means we're injecting more and more carriers into the system, then something very interesting happens. At some intermediate regime, we start seeing two polaritons form. Okay? One very strong with the free exciton that we started with, although it is becoming weaker compared to where we started from. But another polariton type branch starts to emerge. And this now matches the, the trion excitation, which is an exciton and an ex, extra electron. So this basically means now we can get strong coupling at this intermediate uh, injection uh, limit with both the free exciton and this uh, charged exciton or, ex, you know, or trion. And then eventually what happens is as we inject more and more carriers, the strong coupling from the, for the free exciton becomes uh, transitions to weak coupling. We don't see this anti-crossing behavior, but we only see strong coupling with the trion. So this basically means we can take the system in a dynamic manner, and so these are more uh, spectral details, which I won't bother you with. So what happens is, uh, the entire story is basically summarized here. So at zero gate bias, 
we start with very strong coupling with the exciton and weak coupling with the trion. And as we apply a gate bias, inject more carriers, the exciton coupling strength decreases and eventually basically transitions into the weak coupling regime. And the coupling with the trion basically starts to increase and becomes quite significant. And this is something which is, it's almost impossible to do with even a semiconductor which is five nanometers thick because there the screening is going to be dominant and you won't be able to create these stable trions. And another very interesting thing here is when you gate a system, you, know, you basically inject carriers at the interface of your gate oxide and the semiconductor. But the other 99.9% .9 of the material is, you know, does not experience those uh, charges that you inject. But since this material is only a single sheet of material, all the carriers that you put into the system, they're, they're forced to interact. And because the screening is weak, they can, they can interact over longer distances. And hence, at reasonable injection, uh, carrier injection strengths, you can get this very strong behavior. Okay. So this is uh, one attribute of this uh, reduced car uh, 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 carrier uh, screening. But another very interesting aspect is, uh, which, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, now, and that is, uh, you know, so the question, and I'll just take you a few steps back. So the question then we started to ask was, what if we start to increase the number of excitons in the system systematically? So which basically means, what if we stack more layers, you know, going from monolayer to bilayer to a trilayer and beyond? So uh, the distance between the layers is very, very small. And the plasmonic you know, uh, length scale is of the order of, let's say, 10 nanometers. So within 10 nanometers, we can stack many layers, which basically means we can increase the exciton density in the, in, in the vicinity of the field. So what will happen? Okay. So something very interesting starts to happen here. So what we found was when we go from mon monolayer to bilayer to trilayer, so monolayer basically, you know, when we started to look back, it was showing all those things, but it was very hard to uh, you know, uncover that information. But monolayer is the example that I gave you about. You know, we get conventional polaritons. But when we go to the trilayer case, yeah, something very interesting happens, and that is there is this flat line, that, that this dark mode that you see. So this is basically a function of angles of this. Basically, this means in-plane momentum of the excitation. So this basically line, this mode that occurs in the system, which does not exist clearly in the monolayer, starts to emerge in the bilayer, but is very strong in this trilayer, is basically flat and dispersionless. It does not disperse as a function of in-plane momentum of, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the system. Then there is this bright region that you can see this flat bright region. This is basically, this is bright, which basically means that there, there, is, there is no excitation that are allowed in the system. So, so we call this a, a band gap. So we, what we create is a polaritonic band gap because no excitations, just like in an electronic band gap in a region, there are no electronic excitations in the system. Same thing here. And then you have this upper polariton branch. So the question to ask, you know, that we asked was, what is this new mode, origin of this new mode that emerges uh, in, this, in this system? And, and what is the origin of this polaritonic band gap? Okay. But this clearly is a function of the number of excitons that we are you know, creating in the system. Okay. Okay. So, you know, so we, we, we basically, uh, you know, started to do some simulations, you know, you know typical, you know, either COMSOL or you know, finite difference time domain type simulations. Although, you know, those of you who deal with FTDT and all those simulations, you know, they don't give you any microscopic information, but they at least tell you something. So that something was uh, that we could, we could reproduce these features using these FTDT simulations by increasing the number of uh, you know, monolayers in, in the system. You know, and that we can do because we can measure the reflectance. From reflectance, we can get the dielectric dispersion, feed into the system, and we can extract all those things. So we then we started to look systematically at what is happening. So this is, ex so this is basically what was happening. So this is basically, so we create a lattice of these plasmons. So this is, this is a, a particle that we have. So we put two excitons. One, we, when we, one exciton we put in, the, in very close vicinity of this, uh, this particle. So it is, it is very, you know, it is in the very strong field, a plasmonic field limit of this particle. And then this, another, we put another exciton which is far away. Uh, so it does not see this surface plasmon, very strong surface plasmon uh, of this particle, so it's here. So when we have a monolayer, then these two excitons see very different fields. But as we start to increase the number of excitons in the system, basically going from monolayer to bilayer to trial or beyond, then we started to see something very interesting, and that is when we, have, when we, when we increase the number of excitons in the system, then the exciton that is initially far away now starts to see the field of this uh, plasmonic particle, which is in principle, you know, very far away from this, you know, from the otherwise, you know, 
interaction regime of this uh, local plasmonic field. So what this was telling us that as we start to increase the oscillator strength or increase the number of excitons in the system, the system is now becoming collective in the sense that excitons in different regions, physically separated regions in space, start to interact with each other via this plasmonic field. And this is the reason why we have this uh, new mode. So this, so this was basically telling us that what we have is emergence of very strong long-range collective phenomena in this field, uh, in, in the system. And this is basically what is happening is we have exciton-exciton interactions being mediated by the field. Those excitons would not have interacted if the density of them was low and if this was a bulk semiconductor. Because this is a, just a two-dimensional semiconductor, the screening is weak, so the excitons can in principle interact, uh, but they don't interact so strongly in the monolayer case. But as you start increasing the density, they, then they're forced to interact, but mediated by the field. So the field is important, okay? So Im important thing was uh, the equation of state, equation of motion uh, model that we had completely failed to reproduce these features, the new mode and the polaritonic band gap. So we had to do something uh, more. So this is the model that we came up with. So we knew you know, from these simulations that exton exton interactions are becoming strong. So we basically, so we created our own matrix where we basically started to put the excitons in the system and then via these off diagonal elements, we, were fo we forced the excitons to interact with each other. Of course, it has plasmonic field and the lattice mode, and then we diagonalized the whole thing. And when we diagonalized the whole thing, so th these are simulations using this matrix with increasing the number of excitons. And as you can see, when we increase the excitons over a certain limit, then we can start getting this uh, flat mode uh, that we have and the, you know, and, and, and the plurotonic band gap. So all these features can be extracted. So what this is telling us that extonic, extron interaction uh, mediated by this uh, plasmonic, uh, periodic, periodic plasmonic field is really important to extract all these, uh, uh, to, to, to produce all these new features that we are seeing. Okay. Since we can make a integrate this into a transistor, so we started seeing, you know, we started to, ex we could extract something very interesting, and that is, so in a regular polaritonic system that we, you know, other than the, like, where, where the extrons are not interacting with each other, what happens is the splitting, the, the anti-crossing behavior that we have scales linearly with the square root of the number of excitons that are there in the system. So basically, this is a very classic, you know, phenomenon in this polaritonic business. But what we found was in this system, in this collective system, and since we can electrically tune it, the moment this new mode emerges, then basically we, we have a nonlinear increase in the mode splitting in the anti-crossing behavior as a function of uh, a square root of the number of excitons. You know, it should have followed this linear pattern, but it does not, and it shows this nonlinear behavior. So this is another evidence showing that, you know, that we have this collective behavior in the system. And now because it's a collective behavior in the system, you know, we are, we, are, you know, we, are, we are trying to do something more interesting, and that is by creating these uh, more interesting lattices, you know, like a honeycomb la lattice, which can produce this direct dispersion. But then we couple with this uh, uh, collective exciton mode, then we can create this band gap in the system. And then we also have what is called inversion uh, in the system. That means this band has properties of this band, and this band has properties of this band. So it basically means now there's hope that we can get topological you know, polaritons, which are what are called topological polaritons, uh, in the system, uh, so I won't. You know, this is you know, this is an ongoing thing, so uh, I don't have much to talk about here. Uh, but it basically tells us that uh, basically uh, we have what we have is a very interesting system where we have collective excitations in the system that we can control by geometrical parameters, by electric field, and we can create you know hopefully going forward very interesting uh, uh, systems and devices. So I know I have ten minutes or so. So in this, I'll you know, talk about. Another topic you know, that I promised that I will, and that is uh, our efforts, our recent efforts towards understanding how light interacts with what are called topological semi-metals. This is a highly collaborative you know, work. You know, uh, this work was spearheaded by you know, the student that I have, who, you know, who, who in my, you know, she, she's you know, an extremely talented student. So she's a fourth year graduate student in my group, but you know, she's not even 20 yet. So you know, she's that young, and you know, she went to, I think, some special school at USTC where they take young people and put them in college. So she was 12 when she went to college. Uh, so th this work is in collaboration with uh, these two you know, theorists that we have at Penn Physics, who basically started this new field of topological insulators. Uh, Andy Rapp, uh, who's in chemistry, Zheng Liu, who provided us the samples, and all these people who collaborated. Okay. All right, so, you know, so what we have is the following. Uh, so, so as you know, uh, there is this effect in uh, electrochemistry called the galvanic effect, 
So you basically take two chemical reactions with different re uh, redox potentials. You basically complete the circuit and you can extract work from the system or energy out of the system. Okay? So this is the galvanic effect. And equivalent of this is what is called a photogalvanic effect, which happens in, conventionally happens in uh, photovoltaic cells. So at the interface between P and N junctions, because there is this different electrochemical potential here, different Fermi levels, you can separate the carriers or excitons or excitations, and you can produce you know, solar cell, uh, uh, you can extract energy out of the system. Uh, so now the effect that I'm going to talk about is what is called, uh, you know, equivalent of this, but called circular photogalvanic effect, where the idea is you can get this behavior, this type of behavior, you can extract current out of the system without having an interface and without applying any electrical bias. Now, so there's no battery or no nothing that, that we need, and there is no interface also to separate the carriers. So this solar cell behavior is a linear effect because of the presence of the interface, but when we go to a bulk system, then this effect is nonlinear, and the idea is the following, I mean, the, the, experiment, the, the, you know, uh, the phenomenon is what is called the circular photogalvanic effect, and the idea is just like a screw. If you shine light with right circularly polarized, uh, if, if, it, if it has right circular polarization, then you drive the carriers in one direction, and if you change the helicity of light, so if it's left circularly polarized, then you drive the current in the other direction. You know, just like a screw, de depending on the handedness, you can either go in this direction or this direction. Okay. So this effect was discovered in Russia, like many things, in 1970s on tellurium. And uh, what happened, so this is the experiment. So you measure photocurrent without applying any bias as a function of the polarization. So you start with linear polarization. At this point, you have left circularly polarized light. Then at this point, you have right circularly polarized light. And if left and right circularly polarized light produces different photocurrents, that means you have this effect. Otherwise, there's no reason, you know, and to have different currents, photocurrents for left and right circularly polarized light. Most of the materials, that's why this phenomenon is relatively rare, will produce the same amount of photocurrent for left and right circularly polarized light. Yep. So you have this basically means you have to break certain symmetries. Okay? So this basic, this is a second, second order, this phenomenon can be described by the second order uh, 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 tensor. And so if you expand the polarization, this is the linear part, this is the second order part. Uh, and this, in, uh, so what happens in this uh, circular photogalvanic effect is, light of frequency plus omega and minus omega, they interact, so plus, plus and minus omega cancel, so you produce a DC current response, okay? So this is governed by this, uh, this, this susceptibility chi2, and only a very small section of all the point groups, uh, these are called gyrotropic point groups, which produce this phenomena, okay? You have to break certain symmetries, so that's the point. So this phenomena is, you know, as I said, you know, it was discovered in Russia, but now people in the West have, you know, have started to realize it's an important phenomena, so you know, there's a lot of systems that, you know, that, you know, that people are discovering. So a few years back, we showed that this phenomenon can also be seen in a material like silicon. So silicon is not gyrotropic. It's not chiral. It has all the three mirror symmetries. But what we showed, by, uh, showed was by using certain geometrical effects, by cutting the crystal in a particular direction, and applying some fields, electric fields. You know, electric fields break mirror symmetries. So by, by, doing, by combining uh, the geometry, unique geometry and electric field, we could break all the mirror symmetries of the system. And by doing this, we, we basically showed we can produce this circular photogalvanic effect even in silicon. So left, and, left and right circularly polarized light produces different photocurrent, okay? So because this system was made gyrotropic artificially. All right, so now uh, this coming, focusing onto the topic, so that is wild semi-metal. So the topological semi-metals basically, you know, a very brief introduction. So just like in, uh, in, 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 in geometry, you have, you can define, there are certain you know, genuses that using that you can, def, you know, you can define, uh, you, can des, uh, you can describe uh, certain geometrical structures like g equal to zero, there are no holes, g equal to one, there's one hole, g equal to two, two holes. And you, basically you can, you know, unless you punch new holes or you do something you know, drastic, you cannot basically transition from one genus to the other. You know, like for example, you can go from a cup to a donut in a continuous manner, but the number of holes is the same. And if you want to go to two holes, then you have to actually punch another hole. So this basically means that you have these, uh, to, uh, these what are called topological invariants. No matter what you do to this system without dis punching a new hole, you, you basically remain in this genus. So same thing happens and people realized, you know, this started from quantum Hall effect. People realized you can describe electronic states by these uh, what are called topological invariants. And so what happens in topologically non-trivial systems is because of the presence of strong spin-orbit coupling. 
So there is this natural uh, ordering of bands. For example, in most semiconductors, the valence band is made up of p orbitals, conduction band is made up of s orbitals. But because of spin orbit, strong spin orbit coupling, you change the ordering. So that basically gets associated with a particular genus or topological invariant. So when that particular semiconductor or this insulator or you know, this material ends on an interface, let's say even vacuum, then you have to basically, the system basically gets confused at the interface because now you have to go to the normal system. And when you go from one genus to the other, one topological invariant to the other, then you have to basically gap out the system. And that can only occur, those states can only occur at the interface of these two systems. So you create these surface states. Uh, and this is what happens in a topological insulator. But in topological insulator, you have only this type of dispersion only on the surface. And this leads to some complications because transport and all those properties uh, become hard to measure because it's very hard to figure out if it is coming from the surface or bulk. So a few years back, you know, there was this uh, discovery that you can get these uh, three-dimensional dis topological dispersion in what are called wild semi-metals. Uh, and, and then because of which you have this uh, unique, Dirac, uh, unique Dirac dispersion in three dimensions. I won't go through the details. But important thing here is what happens in a wild semi-metal, you start with a Dirac dis you know, dispersion, and then you break a symmetry, either inversion symmetry and or time reversal symmetry. And then you basically split this Dirac cone into what are called two wild cones. And now they have unique chirality. So this basically have fermions which have, you know, which have a one helicity and the other and, and the other cone basically contains the other helicity. Okay. So, uh, so the material, what the recent discovery is, uh, this MOT2 is a wild semi-metal, as people figured out in, in this uh, TD phase, where you break the inversion symmetry, is a wild semi-metal. But this occurs at 250 Kelvin. That's below 250 Kelvin, it's a wild semi-metal. But interestingly, you can also find these materials MOWT2, so you dope some tungsten. And this material becomes a wild semi-metal even at room temperature. So now you can have all these quantum type phenomena at room temperature. So this was uh, the interest, interesting discovery. So people have measured the dispersions using ARPES uh, you know, and, and, and to confirm that it is a wild semi-metal. All right. So the experiment is the following. You know, left and right circularly polarized light, if it produces different response photocurrent, that means it has this circular photogalvanic effect. So we started with this experiment on MOWT2. So at room temperature, as you can see, left and right circularly polarized light produces the same response. So it's not a wild semi-metal. It, it has inversion symmetry, so no response. But the moment we take it to the wild semi-metal phase, left and right circularly polarized light compared to here has different response, which means now it shows the circular photogalvanic effect. But interestingly, what we found was if we shine light here versus here, so these are the two electrodes, no, and we connect, if we connect them but apply no bias. So when we shine on this point and this it's symmetry counterpart on the other side, what we found was the phase of the signal basically reverses. This is low, this is high, and, and, and opposite. So something weird is happening, or different is happening. So we took the laser and then we scanned across the bisector of the two electrodes. So when we are far away, then there is no response. Then as we start approaching the electrode, then the response increases. Then at the intersector of the two electrodes, because you know, it's a high symmetry point, the response goes away, and then it flips the sign. So, so something very interesting is happening. And another interesting thing was, if we keep the laser excitation spot fixed, but we change the laser spot size, then when the spot size is very small, then the response is strong. And as the spot size becomes big, which means in the homogeneous excitation limit, spot is much bigger than, you know, than the size of the sample then the response goes away. So what is happening? So in, to put the long story short, what is happening, and this is a very interesting, unique effect, is if we shine right circularly polarized light, then act, the photocurrent actually circulates, it swirls in the direction of polarization. So this is very intriguing. And if we uh, inverse the polarization, then the polarization, the, the current swirling direction actually changes. So we have swirling currents tracking the you know, polarization direction of light, okay? So this basically meant we had to develop new theories. So Zurun basically worked with the theorists and actually you know, you know, the supplementary information is like 30 pages of her theory. But of course, in, I, mean, I can't supervise that part that well. So this was with these you know, uh, theorists. So important thing to note here is we cannot use the homogeneous optical excitation response function because as I said, there is, the light has to be focused, which basically means light has a spatial profile. There's inhomogeneity. Uh, so this, this basically means you know, we have to derive new response functions, taking into account the spatial inhomogeneity of the optical beam. So in short, the reason why this happens is, uh, you, uh, so the regular conventional uh, circular photogalvanic effect, the response function is given, the, the current is proportional to E cross E star, it's a complex field. So you know, 
So right circle polarized light, E cross goes in one direction, left because the sign changes, the current goes in the other direction. But in this, in our case, because of the inhomogeneous profile of, this, uh, of, the, of light, this basically produces an in-plane momentum of Q vector, uh, you know, which is a radial thing, uh, radial direction of the optical field. So because of this Q cross E star E star, we can produce this circulating photocurrent. So this is the empirical, you know, phenomenological description. But interesting, uh, unique aspect here is, what this was telling us, and that is, the response is non-zero only if, in K space, the excitation at K and minus K is different. So this means inhomogeneous excitation of carriers in the K space. So plus K value and minus K value have to have different excitations. Okay, uh, and then you know, so she she derived the new response functions. Uh, in, an important thing is these response functions they they include this in-plane momentum. They are proportional to the square, and this becomes important square of the band velocities, uh, and they also carry what is called information of the Berry phase, Berry curvature, indirectly related to Berry phase of the system. So it has all these unique attributes. But you know, another very important aspect that we learned was, unlike any other spectroscopic or any other technique, one of the requirements for this inhomogeneous excitation-based CPG, which we call spatially dependent CPG, SCPG, the response will be non-zero only if the scattering or relaxation of the carriers is asymmetric, which basically means a, a scattering at plus k and minus k has to have different rates. If this is not satisfied, then the response will be zero. So this basically means we are probing, we, we, have, we have developed a new technique to probe very different aspects of microscopic physics of this system. So, you know, so, you know, so this is what it is. All right. So uh, recently, we extended the experiment to very low energy excitation, like 6.2 6, 6 microns, so which we, where we are very close to the, uh, the wild cones, where, you know, where very interesting things happen. And the most important thing is the response actually becomes 10 times stronger. So if we extract from this the, the actual response, the strength of the response, it becomes 10 times stronger. And that is because, because the Berry curvature on this, uh, close to the wild cone, actually has a singularity. So it's very, very large. So now we are probing, you know, we are also probing the very large Berry curvature of this system. And, uh, okay. and uh, interestingly, what happens here is, and I think the, this, I have one more slide after this. So by, uh, uh, because the response function is different, so this is related to the Berry, uh, the Berry, Berry curvature of the system, and then this response compared to conventional CPG has the square of the band velocity term. So interestingly, what happens is, as I said, one important aspect of these uh, topological materials is band inversion. Because of this band inversion, the V goes to minus V, uh, omega goes to minus omega, but because V, uh, this is V square, so, and this minus remains, the current, the current direction changes, okay, in, in the vicinity of the wild cone, but not in this conventional CPG, because you have omega times V, so both become minus, and then the response does not change. So it basically means uh, this, this technique in principle can also probe the band inversion regime, you know, where, where the bands are actually not normal and inverted. So, and we've experimentally recently measured this. So at high energy frequency, uh, high energy excitation, as you can see, uh, if we basically fix the spot size and the polarization, let's say here, then current circulates clockwise, but with the same spot size, spot location, and the same polarization, but just by changing the wavelength, coming to low frequency wavelength, the direction of swirling changes, okay? Which basically means the band, bands are inverted. You know, all that information can be extracted. And uh, what, what we have already figured, uh, also figured out is by doing this wavelength dependence, so it's now a spectroscopic technique, and finding the spectral region frequency at which this inversion takes place from swirling in one direction to the other direction, we can extract the asymmetric carrier relaxation time quite reliably. So basically from here we can get, we can extract microscopic parameters. So in short, what, this what, what we've developed is a new technique, a new variant of a technique, which can extract you know, information about Berry curvature, extract information about band crossings and band orderings of inversion, and also asymmetric carrier relaxation. So we can also measure the dynamics of the system uh, through this technique. Okay, so, so with this, uh, uh, so this is just a vision slide. I would like to uh, you know, end my talk by acknowledging my group, so this is my current group right now. Uh, you know, uh, you know, they are the ones who do the work, my collaborators, the funding agencies, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions.
It's a, so, so in the CPG effect in the wire semi-metal, is the, the spin uh, being involved in the, in the circular polarization current? Spin of the carrier? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so unlike gallium arsenide, because when you excite, you, you know, the conduction band is made up of S orbitals. So, so the spin there is, uh, so the orbital angular momentum is zero. So the spin there becomes important. You have pure spin. But these, these are made up of like D orbit, like more complex orbitals. So spin is not pure. Yeah, so it's very complicated. So that's why we had to develop, you know, there the you know, derivation is very easy because, you know, it's just a spin, you know, it's like a spin hall type of, you know, it's basically inverse spin hall of type effect. But here it's more complicated. So this, so what we have includes that response where the spins are pure, but it's much broader. Yeah. Because spins are not pure in the system upon excitation. Any more questions? Well, if not, let's uh, thank the retired one more time.